Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors, to out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, November 11th, 2020, and you're listening to episode 23. Today, we speak with Bruce Joseph of Hodling & Company. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, a Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Or search for our campaign, Whiskey A Chef's Journey, at gofundme.com. That's gofundme.com now. Well, I think it's a cheers to that. (laughs) Let's. Cheers. Cheers. San Francisco has seen many earthquakes, some of them major. The most disastrous of them struck just after 5 a.m. on April 18, 1906. The quake sent violent shockwaves across the Bay Area that could be felt as far north as southern Oregon and as far south as Los Angeles. The Great San Francisco Earthquake, as it came to be known, triggered many fires, some of which destroyed much of the city's historic waterfront. As the fires raged, many of the city's Victorian-era structures were destroyed by flames. Firefighters, hindered by broken water mains, were forced to watch the mounting devastation. The blaze burned throughout the city for six days until it was brought under control on April 23rd. Although most of Jackson Street's waterfront dance halls, brothels, and other dives perished, one building survived. On the second day of the fires, U.S. Army troops arrived. In order to save an adjacent federal government building, they planned to sacrifice that surviving structure. Upon realizing it held precious and flammable cargo, however, the soldiers quickly changed course. That spared building was the AP Hodling Warehouse, then the West Coast's largest whiskey repository. And these quick-thinking, firefighting GIs? They opted to move the whiskey out of harm's way and attempted to salvage what remained of the entire street. While 28,000 buildings, including City Hall, were destroyed, extraordinary efforts were made to save the AP Hodling Warehouse, as well as other structures on Jackson Street. Salt water from San Francisco Bay was pumped in hoses from the Embarcadero across 11 blocks to Jackson Street, and when the salt water proved ineffective, firefighters pumped sewer water in from nearby basements using wine pumps. With the temperance movement in full swing, many commentators from across the land suggested that San Francisco had paid the price for its quote-unquote legendary sinful ways. In the days following the disaster, Charles Field, a local poet, responded with this retort. Quote, If, as they say, God spanked the town for being over frisky, why did he burn his churches down and spare Hodling's whiskey? These words are now memorialized on a commemorative plaque gracing the site. A.P. Hodling's family home in Pacific Heights, unfortunately, perished. In fact, it was dynamited as part of a failed effort to create a firebreak. After the earthquake and subsequent fires, the Hodling business declined and its whiskey warehouse was put to other uses. The building, however, was renovated in 1952 and still stands today. Although A.P. Hodling's original company is no more, another historic San Francisco beverage company, already operating in 1906, has resurrected its name. After a 2017 sale to Japan's Sapporo Breweries forced the separation of the city's famous Anchor Brewing and Anchor Distilling Companies, the distilling operations adopted the name Hodling & Company, Coming up, we speak with Bruce Joseph, master distiller at Hodling & Company, about his work and the fascinating history of this pioneering Bay Area enterprise. Stay with us. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, 
Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we welcome Mr. Bruce Joseph. Bruce is Master Distiller at Hoteling & Co., which many of our viewers might know better as Anchor Distilling Company. Bruce, I'm sure, will, will tell us the tale of the name change. We're particularly fortunate, I'd say, not only is Bruce responsible for some pioneering spirited beverages, but he's also celebrating, we're told, his 40th anniversary with the company. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Philip. Yeah. Yes, I am. 40 years. We're so glad to have you. So tell us, I mean, I'm from San Francisco, so I was very aware of Anchor Distilling. Go ahead and let us know, like... As a child, did you think you'd ever be in distilling and brewing? And if so, how did you see your path going? And if not, how in the heck did you get where you are? I'd start where you grew up. That's always very interesting. Well, I was born and raised in Modesto, California. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, and like a lot of people who grew up in Modesto or the Central Valley, as soon as I could graduate from high school, I left <laughs> and, um, and went to school in San Francisco, at San Francisco State. Oh, so did I. Oh, yeah. Yay, go Gators. Yeah, go Gators. <laughs> I went long enough ago that they actually had a Gator as a mascot, like a live one. Oh, wow. Yeah. My, my parents went there and they, it was so far back that they actually had a football team, which we did not when I was there. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to imagine. I'd like to know the origin story, uh, how San Francisco's uh, nickname became the Gators. The Golden Gate Bridge. Oh. The Golden Gator. Yeah. Okay, there very go. good. So it's not like the youth. No. So it was originally spelled with an E, so Gator, G-A-T-E-R, like the Golden Gate Bridge. Fully understand now. It's a visual. <laughs> anyway, so San Francisco State. Well, I'm glad Carrie was here because I couldn't have answered the question of the origin <laughs> of Gator, San Francisco State. But anyway, I was out of school and I had friends, these two sisters that I went to school with, and their brother had gone to school in Southern California at USC. But he came up and he stayed up here for a while and he was a home brewer. While he was here, he said, I'm going down to Anchor and see if I can get a job. And he happened to walk into Anchor on a day that they needed him. <laughs> <laughs> they put him to work on the bottling line. Nice. And after about six months, he was going to quit because, you know, he hadn't intended on settling here long term. And he asked me, he said, they need someone to take my place. Are you interested? And we had been drinking free beer for those six months. And oh, well, of course, that's a given. You're going to have to take it. Yeah. You need to keep that supply line open. <laughs> I had a job then as a proofreader for one of the, well, at the time, I think it was the big eight accounting firms. And so you can imagine how exciting that was. Um, <laughs> fun, fun, fun. And so I took it. And when I started here at Anchor, there were only 13 employees. The, wow. The company was small. You know, really coming into this, I don't know what my intentions were. You know, I didn't, I, at time in my life, I wasn't making a lot of. Well, it sounded like free beer was the intention. Yeah, that was, that was, <laughs> no, I wasn't making any long range plans. It's a practical approach to career development. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, that's what I thought too. It's like I was taking a cut and pay, but I thought there's the expense too of buying beer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought I'd probably come out ahead. And, it was just a great time to join the company. The company was small. It was growing. And so you could see after about a month, I could see that it was something I was interested in doing. And one of the things that really attracted me to it was the attitude and spirit of the people who worked here. You know, it was really the early days of craft brewing. It was, you know. Mm -hmm. This is 1980, yes? 1980. Yeah. Mm -hmm. About, I think, a month or so after I started here, you know, Sierra Nevada did their first brew. So it was, this is early on. Yeah. Right. Most people didn't know anything about it, but there was a real, like the staff here, they were like on a mission. It was led by Fritz Maytag too, that. The great Fritz Maytag, indeed. The great Fritz Maytag. And Fritz started the company in what year? Well, he bought Anchor Brewing in 1965. Okay. Wow. And at that time, Anchor Brewing was really, it was pretty much like a one-man operation. Mm-hmm. A failing brewery that only did draft beer on really horrible antiquated equipment, and the beer was very inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And I think Fritz bought half the company, 
and bought out the partner about four years later in 1969. And, you know, at that time kind of made the decision that he had to invest some money into it to kind of get it up, up and going so that it could make consistent um, beer. Mm-hmm. So do you know how the anchor name came to origin back then? No, I don't. I, I think <laughs> it was, I think at the time, I think the brewery really was founded like in the 1860s under another name. Ah. And it switched to Anchor Brewing in 1896. Wow. And that nautical theme, you know, I think was pretty popular at that time. You know, that would be my guess, you know, mm-hmm. located in a port city. Sure, sure. I did not realize it was that old of a company. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just always remember it being around my whole life, but I didn't realize it was like from the 1800s. Yeah, it was an old existing brewery that really was on the verge of going out of business. Mm-hmm. It also somehow survived prohibition. Yeah, and probably because it was so small, it closed for prohibition and reopened at another location. Uh Aha, okay, yeah. So you, you're bottling beer. Yeah, and what was nice about having such a small staff is right away there was the opportunity to really work in all aspects Uh of the brewery. So, you know, it was really fun. It was a good team, you know, just a great atmosphere. And, you know, especially those early days of kind of the craft beer world were really a lot of fun and a lot of camaraderie with the other early craft brewers. Yeah, it was just enjoyable. Uh uh You look forward to to coming to work. Well, curious, most local breweries of the day were making, you know, really only one expression, maybe two. Craft distilling meant, oh, let's make an IPA. Let's make a Pilsner, or at least it's attempt to make a Pilsner. Let's make a Porter. What was Anchor doing at the time? Well, at the time, Anchor was doing the two regular beers were Anchor Steam and Anchor Mm -hmm. Porter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Anchor Christmas Ale was a pretty huge thing. It was brewing quite a bit of it in a short period of time. And Liberty Ale became a regular product in 1983. But before that, you know, at that time, the Christmas Ales were still a beer, you know, kind of a pale ale using, um, you know, a lot of the times, Cascade hops. So the the Christmas sale of that era, you know, from the late 70s until Liberty Ale became a year-round beer, were in that style of Liberty Ale. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So when did they start distilling spirits and not just doing beer? We got our license in 1993. Okay. And our first bottling of Old Petrero was released in... January of um, 96. Cool. Yeah. See, I thought it was something around then. Curious, had you become master brewer at the time the the distilling venture began there? No, no. um, No, okay. Fritz was the master brewer. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And president. And the person that hired me was the assistant brewmaster, was Mark Carpenter. Uh Uh-huh. And after Fritz sold the company, he took on the the title of uh, master brewer. Okay, all right. He ran the plant on a day-to-day basis. Okay. So... Once distilling was introduced there, what was your role? Well, you know, after a while, I was kind of distilling. <laughs> I was uh-huh. on, it, it, it was kind of a one-person operation. Most okay. Of the time. You know, I had some help with some stuff and, you know, certainly for bottling, but I was distilling. Okay. In other words, you've effectively served as head or master distiller there since distilling was introduced. Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say I was the master distiller, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, for, a distiller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, head distiller, assistant distiller, I was both. Okay. At the same time, you know, Fritz was very, very involved with it. Uh Uh-huh. Even before we started, and we did a lot of learning as we went. Uh Uh-huh. You know, Fritz, whenever we would do a new project, whether it was beer or the spirits or whatever, Fritz really liked to thoroughly research it, and a plan was pretty thoroughly laid out. Uh Uh-huh. Even though a lot of times he had no problem getting away from what he had originally planned once he saw what, you know, the results were, but mm, he was open to discovery. Yeah. It wasn't the kind of thing where, well, let's just buy a still and slap it in and see what happens. Uh-huh. He liked to think things out pretty sure. Carefully. Cool. So he didn't come up to you one day and say, Bruce, my boy, I'm sending you away for six months. You're going to learn distilling. No, no, we learned it here. Okay. <laughs> we learned it on the job. Nice. Wow. And you know, one thing that I think that was helpful for us was that we didn't really have a timetable for when we had to have a product out on the market. You know, we had 
the brewery to support what we were doing. Right. So I thought that was a huge advantage that we could take our time and try to learn what we were doing and revise things and, mm -hmm. you know, get to the point we wanted to, to be at before we, mm -hmm. we had to think about selling something. So what were the first spirits you guys had come off your stills? Rye whiskey. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And that was, I think, Fritz's motivation for having a distillery. He had talked for quite a few years, probably from the mid 80s or so, about how interesting, you know, the story of rye whiskey um, sure. was. Mm -hmm. And that I think it kind of satisfied Fritz on two levels. He really liked something that had some historical angle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that interested him in buying Anchor Steam in the first place was the history of steam beer in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that always interested him was he didn't like to do things that were already popular. He really liked to do things that were unpopular. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, as you know, at that time, like 80s and, you know, early 90s, there wasn't any interest in rye whiskey. Oh, no. There was a very small handful of rye whiskey brands in the marketplace, and they'd been around since pre-prohibition. Yeah. And so had, had somehow survived. You know, when we started distilling, what you could find here was Old Overholt. Mm -hmm. Yep. Jim Beam Rye. I, I think you could find Pikesville, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a couple mm -hmm, places. But, mm -hmm. you know, every bar had a dusty bottle of yes. Old Overholt mm -hmm. on the back bar. Mm -hmm. Yep. Never looked like it was touched. Right. So this is perhaps the first sort of, you know, craft rye to hit the market. Yeah. Don't know exactly, but I'm thinking it very might be. Well, probably definitely in California, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what, uh, you know. Yeah. So how about the name, Old Potrero? Yeah, we're on Potrero Hill. And I mm -hmm. think Fritz liked the angle that, you know, the old part on Old Potrero, that's the thing, you know, that at the time it was ATF. Mm -hmm. You know, they consider that the fanciful name. You know, the old doesn't really have to be true. Too old, right. Yeah, and mm -hmm. our first our first bottling was, um, the first release was 13 months old. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, we were brewers. And... It killed us to wait 13 months. You know, at five months, we thought, oh, man, this tastes like whiskey. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know you're know, you used to like a month from brewing to bottling. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's a hard transition. Yeah. Right? Sure. So we were so excited to bottle it. And then another thing that Fritz had wanted to do is he didn't really announce that we were starting a distillery. His kind of dream was that the public would know that we had a distillery when we released our whiskey. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a top secret operation here. You know, that did, sounds so fun. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. This several year secret you're keeping from everybody. Yeah. 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 This is back in 93, was it, that you started working on the, the rye? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, you know, the bottling, well, we started working on it. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there was a certain amount of trial and error. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. You started making your mistakes in 1993. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, certainly we didn't want to go to the expense of putting the early stuff in barrels. Uh -huh. So we waited a while before we actually got barrels. Uh -huh. And so that first bottling was in early in January of 96. Okay. All right. I'm curious as to the, uh, was permitting a challenge? Because, you know, to this day in a lot of states, they still don't know what to do with distillers. It's like, well, we haven't permitted distilleries and, well, we don't remember ever doing it. Yeah. What was it like? You know, I wasn't involved very much uh -huh. with that end of it. But You don't want to do the boring stuff. You want to do the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was certainly the situation where the city didn't really know what we were doing. And I think there was a certain amount that they could see the brewery was kind of a professionally run operation that we adhered to all the re local requirements on that end. And I think there was a right. certain amount of trust, but, you know, I don't think they had any idea. Even when ATF, after we had been open for a while, mm -hmm. they did an inspection. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the federal agency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always wondered why firearms is with that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Combustible substances. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> But even even they didn't. Okay. Right. I think the people at their regional office in Oakland, you know, this might have been the first distillery they had been in. Sure. That they'd ever seen. Sure. Yeah. They walked by the stills and went back to the room where we have storage tanks and asked if those were the stills. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm curious, this is pot distilled, which of course is, you know, a traditional method of production. Uh, it's also called a uh, single malt, presumably because it is 100% malted rye. Yeah, and it looks like this is getting ready to change so that there's going to be, you know, a real definition for single malt in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for the United States, but at the time for American made whiskeys, single malt, you know, had no official definition. Right. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was, you know, putting single malt on the label, you know, was just to point out that it was all malted rye, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, you know, a small percentage of malted rye or malted barley or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. So you were just saying that that's probably going to be discontinued once the TTB in Washington defines American single malt. Yeah, Yeah. because I think the definition they're going for specifies malted barley. Uh Uh-huh, sure. Well, then you'll just have to petition a single malted rye term. You could get grandfathered in, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If you say single malt rye after it, I mean, it's obviously telling you. I don't know. Yeah, well. Bureaucrats never know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Bruce, we normally wait until the end of the interview to taste with the interviewee, but we have four things here and each has a rich backstory. So why don't we taste at the end of each backstory? I like Old Petrero in, in cocktails because I think it stands up, you know, really well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm biased, so. So is this the same rye that you've been making this whole time or is it morphed over the years? You know, it's aged longer. And I don't know, which which one do you have? We, we have, have Old the Petrero Straight, Straight, Straight Rye. Rye. Yeah, our very first bottling was the 18th century, which is aged in toasted barrels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is charred. Yeah, this is charred. Okay. And right from the beginning, we were putting whiskey in new toasted barrels, new charred barrels, and at first used bourbon barrels. And we transitioned as we had our own Down the road, once we had our own used charred barrels, we started using those. But, you know, we have three different expressions, the difference being the three different barrel types. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. The nose on this is very bright. Yes. Just super, super bright and a very, a hint of caramel. Anyway, just wanted to say that. Yes. And the taste, it's very bold. Mm -hmm. It's very sharp and it's got a really nice, complex heat. It's not like a hit you in the face heat. It's just a very... I think it goes very well with the boldness and the straightness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I love it. And a nice long finish, too. Yeah. It's great. A nice long, even finish. Bruce, this is but one of several old Petrero expressions. Can you tell us about the rest? Yeah. The straight rye whiskey, again, is new charred oak, standard size, 53 gallon barrels, aged a minimum of four and a half years, most of them around five years. Okay. Far past the minimum. Yeah. Yeah. And bottled at 97. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we started out, we bottled everything at barrel strength and they were, you know, 120 plus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was very advanced at the time. I mean, there was, I mean, you talk about no one making rye. (laughs) There wasn't a lot of uh, cask bottling going on back then. No, not much. You know, we would do, you know, when there were chances to pour whiskey and you'd always get people who would just want to drink it undiluted. You'd offer them like a little water for it or something. And and so at some point we started diluting it. And so you added the water for them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we just felt like the whiskey kind of presented itself better at, you know, in the case of the straight rye whiskey, 97, the 18th uh-huh. century is um, 102. Okay. 0.4, and then the, the Hodling's uh, Old Petrero is 100 proof. It's bottled in bond, you know. So, uh, okay. But we like it right around there, like around 100 for all three of them. Yeah. There's a port finished as well. Is that correct? Yeah. And right now we've done some different barrel finishes. The one we've done the most is our port barrels. Mm-hmm. And we're lucky to get used port barrels from Fritz Maytag's vineyard from his wine. Ah, okay. Right. Is that in Napa? Yes. Or Sonoma? Uh, in Napa. Napa, okay. Yeah, Spring Mountain. Oh, okay. Does he send care packages of cheese as well? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when Fritz still owned owned Anchor, um, yeah, we got a shipment, I, I don't know, it was once a week, once every other week or something. Wow. Mm-hmm. Of his family's cheese? Yeah. That's glorious. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, no longer. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, things change, Joe. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what was the next expression you guys started, or next, not expression, but the next- Spirit. Um, spirit, yes, that you started 
I was going to say shooting at your distillery, <laughs> that yeah. you started producing at your distillery? Well, you know, as soon as we felt confident enough to start putting um, new spirit into barrels, we started working on gin. Okay. okay. And the result of that being Junipera, which came out in 97. I wanted to ask you about that. So Junipero, I'm wondering if that's a cross name between <laughs> Juniper and Hanipero Serra, because Hanipero Serra, you know, the streets up there and it's a big California. Yeah. And Hanipero Serra, the quite literally founding father in two respects of California. Yeah. 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 No, I've, I've seen people refer to that, but, you know, it was really to kind of celebrate Juniper berries. Okay. You know, I don't think that's the main translation for juniper in Spanish, but it is one that's also used. Okay. Right. So, you know, the intention was to do a gin that was pretty bold and juniper forward. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Fritz did the naming. So, okay. I don't know. I shouldn't speak for him, but I think that's uh, mainly where it understood. Was. Understood. And, and for gins at the time, I mean, there were really no craft gin. This is the. I think even Hodling calls it the first American craft gin. Yeah. You know, really like the kind of the high end gin at the time was uh, Bombay Sapphire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any others that were out, but yeah, I think we were the first one to come out. Hendrix didn't come out until about a year and a half or two years after we came out. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. Yeah. It's a very beautiful gin. I'm sad though. It's not a double entendre. <laughs> I was really hoping I nailed that. <laughs> It's really hot, too, for a gin of, you know, 1997, you say it was introduced. Mm -hmm. Most gins in the market were 80, 85 proof. This sits at, what, 98.6? Yeah. You can find gins at that heat and higher today, and Navy strength, of course, but... But it doesn't taste hot. Yeah, it doesn't burn hot in the mouth. No. But that was really a really high proof for a gin, you know, 23 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, I think some of the things that resulted in kind of how the product was released was probably because we didn't know very much about gin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a higher proof. It's unfiltered. Yeah, there's that as well, which contributes to an incredible mouthfeel. Yes. Yeah, that's what we thought is we did a lot of experimenting to kind of arrive at this certain intensity of flavor. And when we thought about then starting to work on filtering it, we didn't want to do that. And then also the other thing was, that's what we thought too, was we really weren't aware of any other gin that had a little bit of mouthfeel like that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we had someone tell us, well, you can't not filter a gin because when you make a, a drink, it's going to cloud up. And I don't know, Fritz was uh, pretty adamant that we could do that. And that, I don't know if it was the kind of the, the craft beer background that made him feel that if you explain to people why it's cloudy, that they would be accepting of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and these days, I mean, I know that when I was in my 20s, the only people that had tastings of any kind were wine tastings. There was no spirit tastings anywhere. But now, like you can find tastings almost of any spirit, especially if Philip's involved, because he <laughs> we, we do runs, a, runs all these different uh, tasting outfits. We do a great many tastings, yes. We taste everything. So, I mean, now I get to the point where all you need to do is have a story and people just yeah. love it. I first encountered this gin yeah. at one of our early Los Angeles seminars, the Cocktail Collection, back in 2014. One of our drink masters for one of our seminars said, oh, I'd like to use uh, Junipero in this particular cocktail. And so we had, we had, we always have uh, a relationship with then Anchor. And so we got a, a case of it in and um, I forget what he made with it, but it was glorious. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, a couple of other things. One, you make other gin expressions. You do a Geneva, you do an aged Geneva, you do an old Tom. How involved were you in developing and introducing those expressions? Um, very. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us about that evolution? Because again, no American distillery was making Geneva. It's the Belgians and the Dutch who do that, not Americans. Yeah. Yeah. We started really early playing around with it. I think, you know, our first distillations were in 99 uh -huh. and I don't think we released it until 2007, but okay. it was something that we did distillations and we taste it and then we kind of make some changes and then mm -hmm. do it. So it was something we, we played around with, but there wasn't really that mm -hmm. any urgency to do it. It was something that was kind of on the back burner. Yeah. 
And then we finally arrived at, we wanted to use the same botanicals as Junipera Mm -hmm. in different proportions, of course. Mm -hmm. Again, we did a a mash of a combination of barley, wheat, and rye. Okay. And it was distilled a lot like we distilled whiskey. It was a double distillation. We did a wash distillation and then did a spirit distillation with botanicals. Mm -hmm. And we found that not a lot of Americans are really familiar with the style. Sure. Yeah. Got a call from this one guy and he said, a friend of mine told me to buy Anchor's gin and I bought a bottle and there's something wrong with it. (laughs) (laughs) And I think his friend told him to buy a bottle of Junipero and he bought a bottle of uh, Genevieve. Okay. He had no idea what he got or thought we didn't know what the hell we were doing. That's funny. I have a word for our listeners and a request of you. The word for the listeners is stay calm. This show is not morphing into spirits of gin, but to honor this man's 40 (laughs) years of service and being such a pioneer, we wanted to go more through and he's responsible for, you know, the American craft gin movement uh, in part. We wanted to honor that service by tasting more than his whiskeys. Request of you, can you explain, can you tell our listeners the difference between gin and Geneva? Well, I think the, especially with whiskey people is, you know, like a Geneva is basically like a whiskey with botanical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've done two versions of it. We've done unaged and we've Mm -hmm. done aged. Barrel aged. Yeah, barrel Mm -hmm. aged in our used hard barrels. (laughs) You know, I think it really presents itself better as an aged product. Uh Aha. Uh-huh. Whereas something in the London dry style, like our Junipero, you're starting with a neutral spirit base mm-hmm. and then redistilling with the botanicals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all the flavors are coming from the botanicals. Mm-hmm. Right. And with the Genevieve, you're getting all of those grain character and, you know, the fermentation uh, character and the botanicals. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, I think that's the interesting thing with with R2 is that it's the same botanicals. You can really get an idea of how the base alcohol kind of influences the perception of the botanical. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And perhaps a word about the Old Tom, because when you introduced Old Tom, it was pretty much only the English who were making Old Tom. Now, Old Tom was quote-unquote popular in the U.S. In fact, it figured in some important seminal cocktails, but it virtually disappeared. And you introduced it as an American craft spirit. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's another gin and not quite as juniper forward, but we used star anise and licorice root. Mm -hmm. Mm. And while those aren't sugars, they give the perception of sweetness. And yes, the flavonoids are in common with some sweet goods featuring those items featuring those ingredients. Yeah. And I didn't want the old Tom to be, you know, I don't like things that are cloyingly sweet. So the sweetness that's there, a lot of it really comes from those two botanicals. Mm -hmm. And then we had a suggestion here that instead of using sugar, we use stevia instead. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. And we used very, very little stevia, actually. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the thing. It was just, it has a pretty good amount of licorice. Mm -hmm. I have a bottle of your old Tom with the anchor label on it, and I'm I'm still nursing it. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. Okay, so you started with rye, you went to gin, then what was the next spirit you guys started? Well, really, that's the main stuff that we do. We've done some other things. We have some things that haven't been bottled and released yet. Mm -hmm. Those are the main things. And, you know, we've always been a little limited for our production because we're all this time of shared space with Anchor Brewing, we don't really have space to spread out and grow much. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we've done some things, you know, we went into different barrel finishes. We've done some of that, but we haven't had really the resources to kind of branch out into a lot of other products. But, you know, that's something that we're doing more of now, although we haven't seen them released yet. Well, we did also get the J.H. Cutter Whiskey. And the, is it Hirsch Horizon? Yes, yes. So tell us a bit about those. How did those come about? And what exactly is the J.H. Cutter Whiskey? It says perfect blend of American whiskeys. So what kind of whiskeys is in that? Well, this was kind of a project where we kind of recognized that Old Petrero 100% malted rye is kind of a unique spirit and a big whiskey. Here we go. (laughs) <laughs> and the idea with J.H. Cutter was to make something that was maybe a little more accessible for a lot of people. 
And so the J.H. Cutter is a combination of sourced Kentucky bourbon and then our 18th century whiskey and then our ultra port finished whiskey. Wow. And the idea was to take a bourbon, but then I like the idea that our part of the component, would, it would still have kind of that old Petrero house character. Mm-hmm. Right. I can definitely taste that in there. Yeah. That's no, it's good. So, you know, and it's just like the port finish is a small, it's 10% and then 17% of the old Petrero 18th century. And the rest is bourbon. I almost taste licorice on it. And I don't know if that's because I had the gin before this and it's tainting my palate. Or is that something that you normally get? You mean enhancing? You mean enhancing your palate? <laughs> I, I meant tainting it for this this Indeed. dram sip. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> so, do you get that as a common note, or is that because I had the gin first? Yeah. Well, I think a little bit. The rye comes through, and it it has those kind of spicy qualities. Right. I want to go back to the name change, and what I was going to say when we were talking about. Okay, so you introduced Old Pachero multiple expressions. You introduced uh, the gin, then you introduced a couple of Genevers and an old Tom. And this was all under the Anchor, Anchor Distilling Co. Which, by the way, Anchor is the name of our distribution (laughs) company. (laughs) So that's kind of funny. (laughs) That's right. Anchor.fm. You can find all of our work there. Yes. All right. Yeah. So anyway, yes. So I was thinking that that's a good segue into the name change. Yeah, so what happened? Yes, there were press releases in 2018, but a lot of people are still confused as to why it's no longer Anchor and it's Hoteling and Co. And I think the origin story of Hoteling is fascinating. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. And what was your stance on this? Did you have a strong feeling either way about changing the name? Well, it was part of the deal. We had to change the name and Fritz Maytag sold Anchor Brewing and Distilling in 2010 to a group and one of the principals was Tony Folio. In 2017, they sold Anchor Brewing to Sapporo, but they kept Anchor Distilling. And by then, Anchor Distilling, you know, when they took over in 2010, Anchor Distilling, we were a producer, a distillery, but we're also an importer. Mm -hmm. Massive. Big time. Yeah. Over 400 brands in the portfolio, at least as of today. Really? <laughs> <laughs> glad glad we could help. Uh, <laughs> yes. We don't do any research before we have people. Yeah, in. that's good. I mean, <laughs> so as I said, when Anchor Brewing and Distilling was split up, the brewery was sold to Sapporo, but the owners kept the distillery. And part of the agreement with Sapporo is they bought the Anchor name and I think we didn't have to change names for about, that happened in August of 2017. We changed our name, I believe, in February of 2018, something Mm -hmm. like that. And we had a little longer time to use up labels and packages. I was going to say, you're going to have all these labels and bottles and things that, Yeah, I mean, that's a waste of money if they're not letting you use it. So Yeah, so we had even longer after the name change to use up that stuff. So. We had been using the hodling name for one expression of Old Petrero since 2006. You know, our at the beginning when we were putting whiskey into new charred oak, new toasted oak, and then used bourbon barrels, the stuff that went into the used bourbon barrels, we hadn't released. And as we we're getting close to 2006, that whiskey was 11 years old, and Fritz wanted to do something for the 100th anniversary of the great San Francisco earthquake. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. And the story of the Hodling Whiskey Warehouse during the 1906 earthquake was kind of a famous story of how the city was burning down, and but they managed to save this warehouse full of whiskey and whiskey mm-hmm. barrels. you got to have priorities. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's, it reminds me of Whiskey Galore when they just went after the shipwreck to not save the boat, but to get the whiskey off of it. There you go. You know, if you can only do some of it, do the most important part. Mm. Right. And so that version of Old Petrero mm-hmm. that is in used charred barrels is um, now known as Hodling's Old. Right. So AP Hodling was a San Francisco spirits merchant. Yes. Yeah. You had already adopted the name for an expression of Old Petrero, but when it came time to change the name from Anchor to something else, you went with AP Hodling. Yeah. It was, you know, kind of a tie to, you know, what we had done as Anchor Distilling. Mm -hmm. And also it was, you know, kind of a tie to 
the whiskey business here in San Francisco. It's deeply rooted. Yeah, indeed. Right. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, the whole story about the warehouse is kind of a fun, interesting story. Sure. And I don't know if you've read the poem that someone back in the day wrote about saving the Hodling warehouse. Do you know it? Well, yeah, and maybe not word for word, but... Paraphrase it for us. <laughs> yeah, at the time, newspapers around the country were saying that the 1906 earthquake was God's retribution for kind of the wild ways and loose morals. For the Barbary Coast. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Mm-hmm. And this local guy wrote this thing, is, and I believe it's, if as they say, God spanked the town for being over frisky... Why did he burn the churches down and save Hodling's whiskey? Yay! I love it. (laughs) That is beautiful. Yeah, I can send you a picture of that's on the back label of Hodling's whiskey. Okay. All right. Well, for the benefit of our listeners, again, A.P. Hodling was a 49er. He came to California. He went to California intending to strike it big in gold. But like most people, like most 49ers, he failed. Uh, but, and by 49er, he does not mean the football team. He means no, the gold, gold strikers, 49ers. Great gold rush yeah. of yes, 49. Gold rush. 1849. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, but uh, not so much. But he went into uh, spirits and became, from what I read, the biggest spirits merchant on the West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. one of those successful gold miners that were successful because they um, shifted gears and did something else. Uh-huh. Right, right. And and one of the things he did as a merchant is sold custom blends. And the J.H. Cutter name is somehow tied in with that, is it not? Yeah, J.H. Cutter was one of his premium whiskey. He had another one, too. That was one of his house blends, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it was a sourced whiskey. They didn't distill here, but they aged and uh, bottled. Mm-hmm. Okay. Indeed. So, on to Hirsch. Yes. Now, tell me about this label. It looks like some sort of geography type symbol. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that reference to the horizon and, and um, it really is a beautiful package. That's a new package. And, you know, you guys probably know the history of, of a church and it, it was, we're not chiming in. We're not saying, yes, we do. <laughs> no, wait, I'm, I'm reading it. It's on the back of the label right now. In 1974, A.H. Hirsch first imagined. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, you guys are doing great. Oh, we do. Okay. All right. All right. A.H. Hirsch wasn't a distiller, but he bought this whiskey from Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And it didn't get bottled. And then later in the 80s, it got bottled as, I think, everywhere from a 16 to 20-year-old. It had a great reputation and i don't know there's even a book called the best bourbon you'll never taste i believe Uh uh-huh uh-huh now you say they're from pennsylvania and one expects rye out of pennsylvania yet they were bourbons yeah yeah the importing company that the current owners brought into anchor distilling ended up owning the name and so we've always done it as a sourced whiskey and it's gone through some things and it's this is kind of you know the repackaging you know redoing it how long has hodling been doing this how long has hodling been marketing the hirsch you know the whole time okay oh wow okay the old stock had run out Uh uh-huh so this is kind of a new version a new blend that's been put together and these are out of lawrenceburg indiana correct yeah this one is Mm -hmm. it's a blend of two bourbons distilled there and two different mash bills Mm mm-hmm and a blend that we really liked. Mm -hmm. And there'll be different versions of this. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I read that on the reverse, the the reverse label, there's a very lot of detail about the blend and the mash bill of the bourbons that go into here. And then that will be the case with each subsequent release. Yes. You know, I think it's good when doing source whiskeys to Mm -hmm. be totally transparent. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. This is where it comes from. This is the age of it. This is the mash bill, I think. I don't know. I think that's the way to go. Yeah. The show feels that it's totally fine to do sourced whiskey as long as you're transparent about doing sourced whiskey. Yeah, indeed. And so much of the magic happens in the blending and finishing. Correct. And this is something that it's worked that way for hundreds of years. But of late, because of a few, shall I use the term, scuff laws. Yes. It's become a source of controversy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, it's kind of fun because it's kind of a new endeavor to take whiskeys that are quite different and put a blend together. And, right. mm-hmm. you know, we started with that with the J.H. Cutter 
which was a real fun process. And then it's been real fun with the Hirsch too. Uh-huh. And, and that'll continue as we uh, go into the future. One of the things I find fascinating about the J.H. Cutter, there's kind of a cottage industry now in revivifying extinct brands and retro-engineering the recipes. In this case, you've taken a, yeah, I don't know, you've exactly retro-engineered the blend, but this was an established blend that you're now sort of recreating. Yeah, this was really just paying a little tribute to the name. Okay, um, We didn't really have access. Understood. Any access to what the blend tasted like. Yeah. Well, this brings up another, this notion of transparency or critical issue of transparency brings to mind another point. In I read that in 2016, you released the full list of botanicals for Junipero, or Junipero rather, your Junipero gin. And that is highly unusual for a gin maker to release that full list. Can you tell us what was behind that? You did it on the 20th anniversary of the Junipero's uh, <laughs> initial appearance, yes? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't my idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, that some of my coworkers thought it would be an interesting thing to do and, you know, that people would like to know. And I spent 30 years working for Fritz Maytag, who really was fairly secretive. So, mm. you know it just came natural to be really vague about what we did. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting used to this, but to, to be to be more open about everything. You've been, we, Carrie, I would think we would agree. Bruce has been reasonably forthcoming. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Torero and, and open up. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no filters. <laughs> there you go. So what do you guys have coming up next? What's your next venture for distilling? And what's your next venture for blending or sourcing or sourcing or bringing in uh, adding to the import portfolio and and a sidebar question if you'd cover it in this portion have you played any curatorial role in building the import portfolio no i haven't okay (laughs) you know we've added a lot of whiskey Mm -hmm. to the imports and really have i I think a pretty interesting world whiskey collection you know Mm -hmm. japan taiwan Ireland, Scotland. Yeah, you're the Cavalon importer, are you not? Yeah, Cavalon, Nika, mm-hmm. Dingle, uh, you know, just pretty good selection. So mm-hmm. it's uh, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. So to Carrie's part of the question, what might we look forward to? In your distilling and in your blending versus your importing. Well, you know, we have some other things that are coming up and, you know, most of them I can't really talk about yet, but... Um, okay. But, but, <laughs> All right, this... this our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, if I don't tell, you're going to hang up on me? No, 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 no. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> cocktails. Well, then I think we need to shift to our regular closing conversation, which is cocktails. And since you have so many different varieties here of things that we've tasted today, what well, I'll let you ask, uh, Philip. It's your it's your question. Uh, well, it's it's the world's question. Bruce, what is your favorite? No, we never ask what your favorite cocktail is. We want to know what's your go-to. What are your go-tos? As director of the cocktail collection, I am always on the receiving end of the question, what's your favorite cocktail? My standard response is, as if. Why limit myself? I have a bias for one category, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Tell us about you. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I probably don't go out as much as some people or some people in the industry do. Don't get around much anymore? But, Isn't that true? Okay. <laughs> when I travel, you know, and I'm with like our sales or marketing people, I do get a good opportunity to go to really good places doing cocktails. I bet, yeah. And I really like to just let them recommend something, whatever they are got going or something they're interested in or you know, if they're using something that's seasonal, you know, I like to do that. And mm-hmm. not to evade your question. You no, know, I not like, at all. Dealer's choice. Understood. Yeah. 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 You know, I like the old standbys. You know, I, I love like a Manhattan with Old Petro in it. Uh-huh. And I love martinis, mm-hmm. no olives with a twist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Bruce, just so you know, you're in the process of passing the test. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 Manhattan is also my favorite cocktail. So yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I like a lot of the just traditional uh, kind of old school cocktails. And then really for some of the other stuff, I think it, it's fun to just go with what someone recommends to you. Yeah, yeah, that is fun, especially if you go to like a place you haven't been before and they've got all these crazy cocktails that aren't the norm on their menu. 
I think it's fun to experiment with all these new fangled cocktails that people are coming up with. Yeah. And one of the things, these three whiskeys we have before us today, I mean, I think all three of them, they're, and they're all on the hotter side. They're all in the high 90s, yes? Including the cutter? Uh, let me see. Cutter... The cutter is 94. 94. Okay. Yeah. So they're all in the mid to high 90s, which means they're all designed to cut through cocktails. They're all designed to shine brightly in a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. Although I have to say this, they all shine brightly on their own. They're all very enjoyable sips all on their own. And this Hirsch is just, oh my God, this Hirsch is incredible. But they all, they all would shine through brightly in a cocktail. And to Carrie's point earlier about the Sazerac and the old Pacharo in the Sazerac. Oh yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. 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 It was a great Sazerac on the old Pichero. And I can't wait to make gin and tonic or gin martini with the Junipero. I mean, with the Juniper. No, Junipero. Yeah. That, Junipero. You, you call it Junipero. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So great. Likewise. Likewise. And I'm, I'm thinking about this now. I'm thinking I'm going to steal some of that uh, old Tom gin made by your hand and make myself a Martinez tonight. Mm. Boy, that sounds good. I have to go home. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I may be coming over, Philip. <laughs> well, Tom from Anchor, well, Hodling, nay, Anchor. I have some Luxardo Maraschino liqueur, which is imported by Hodling and Company. Hodling. Oh, I indeed. Yay. Indeed, I have all the ingredients I need to make a classic Martinez, all of them imported or made by Hodling and Co. Perfect. I'll be over in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Well, Bruce, thank you so much. It's been a joy to talk to you. And I always love talking to Native Californians, especially about Native Californian stuff. <laughs> so it's been a lovely pleasure. And the next time you have some fancy new release you want to talk about, feel free to call us up and we'll bring you back on the show. Please. We want to know everything that you can't talk about today, but can talk about in future. Correct. Fantastic. I hope it's not too long. <laughs> likewise. Likewise. Bruce, thank you so very much. Thank you. It was a fun time. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and L.A. Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel that offers a diverse and growing slate of food and drink series, featuring a mix of how-to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are culinary quickies, Le Cocktail Du Jour, V is for Vino, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. Upcoming shows include Cocktails, The Grand Tour, a new series starring Jonathan Pogash, a.k.a. the Cocktail Guru, the award-winning Music and Booze with Mo, featuring Mo Herms and his series of musically spirited cocktailians, and an all-new wine podcast, hosted by Silver Pin Certified Sommelier Stacy Hunt. We're streaming culinary culture, so please visit YouTube, search for the Center for Culinary Culture, and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink one taste at a time. Hey, Louise, good to have you here this week. We're going to talk about some hodling whiskeys. I gave you a couple of whiskeys and they even had a gin. So what'd you think? Well, hello there, Carrie. Great to be back. Well, you know, I ended up deciding that I wanted to talk about the old Petrero rye. Um, good choice. Good choice. I mean, listen, I could have easily talked about any of them, but really it was bringing me back to a time and place in my 20s, you know, back in the good old days and the early aughts at my local pub that was a beer bar. It was really a haven for craft beer lovers. It was a place in Williamsburg, Brooklyn called Mugs Ale House, not like the fanciest of names. However, great beer selection. And it was the first time I ever saw Old Petrero because it was owned by Anchor back then. And right. so, you know, of course, I knew about drinking Anchor Steam Beer and Anchor Liberty Ale and the Anchor Holiday Christmas Ale is amazing. And so, of course, you know, that was like, and I love rye, as we all know by this point. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so that was like an easy sell for me. And the minute I saw it, I was like, let's see if this still does it for me. And it does. 
So yeah, on that note, when thinking about a pairing, my pairing is a nip of old Potrero and a pint of beer, but that doesn't really do us any good here, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's my first pairing. My second pairing is, well, I think we need to eat Dungeness crab while, oh. while we are drinking an old Potrero. Yes, yes. Like, I think of this as kind of the holy trinity. We go with a nip of old Potrero, a pint of beer, and a steamed Dungeness crab. There it is. And I want to do this while being at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Yeah, I think it's kind of necessary that you're looking at the water while doing this. And there needs to be some really garlicky drawn butter and there needs to be sourdough. Yeah. So, you know. Some San Francisco Bodine sourdough. Exactly. There's nothing like it. Making me want to take a trip up north. (laughs) Well, it's waiting for you. I mean, you're, you're from not too far, right? Yeah, I went to school there, and uh, uh, you know, I lived in San Jose, but uh, we went to San Francisco quite often. You know, and I lived there during college, so yeah. I'm jealous. I really, I didn't start discovering San Francisco until I moved out here to LA, and you know, it it bums me out that I I didn't think to visit there more often, like back in like the '90s and early 2000s when you could actually still afford to do things there. <laughs> um, you know, people say that, but you know. Back when I lived there, <laughs> it was in the 90s, and this was super expensive back in the day, but we had a one-bedroom apartment that was $900, but well, all the other apartments were like $200. Back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't even I don't even want to imagine how much that apartment goes for now. And that like, it's probably 3, 000, 3, What neighborhood's it in? Oh, it's right next to San Francisco State. I'm yeah. sure it's tremendous. Yeah, it's redonkulous, I'll have to cut this out, too. Say. Yeah. We digress. But that's that's my pairing for, for this week's Old Potrero. I mean, it. I just, I had such nostalgia drinking it. I can't think of a better way to consume it with a big ass crab, to be honest. Yeah. And the sourdough bread. Oh, and the butter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. As, as always, it sounds wonderful. And now I'm hungry and I think I'm going to go fix myself some dinner and I will catch up with you next week. All right. I'll talk to you then, Carrie. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salon. Salon You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. Just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.